I want to make this appeal, not that it really has to be, but at least give it emphasis to keep Tyler in your prayers. Tyler's a pretty quiet fellow. Unless you're emailing him, then you think he's two different people. But he is uh, certainly in losing his great-grandmother a couple of years ago. and Now James, he's, he's going to be kind of alone. He is a bit of a loner anyway, but he's a good guy. And I told him this morning that I said, let me give you this encouragement in the days ahead. Try to be as much with your brethren in Christ as you possibly can. I said, let me encourage you to do that. And I want to urge you to encourage him along that line because in working with his grandfather and before that uh, with his uh, grandmother, he was adjusting himself to come only in the mornings and not come in the afternoon and so forth. Or I think we'd do well to encourage him to be at all the services. Uh, that would make a difference. So let's keep him in mind, not that you wouldn't, but just to be mindful of his situation. We studied this morning and gave emphasis toward the end of our lesson that divine law is not subordinate to civil law, that wherever civil law has any kind of comment on anything religious or spiritual or moral, if it goes against what the Bible teaches, then we simply do not abide by it. We do what God said and the way he said it for the reason he said it. But in continuing our study of this whole thing on marriage and remarriage, uh, marriage, divorce, remarriage, consider with me now uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. You'll recognize this as being a part of the great Sermon on the Mount. And herein, in verses 31 and 32 of chapter 5, uh, Jesus declared, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now the context of our Lord's teaching that one, he had not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. And number two, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. That's the context in which he gives his instruction of Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law of Moses. And therefore, at the proper time, the authority of that law was ended. Paul makes that clear in Romans 10, verse 4. And then we're very familiar with his writing in Colossians 2, 14 through 17, where he says these handwriting ordinances were against us, contrary to us. They're taken out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now let's keep in mind that the fundamental purpose of the law of Moses was to bring us to Christ. And that was so that we could be justified by faith. Literally, it would have to do with a system of faith that is the perfect law of liberty for which faith we are to contend, James 1, 25 and Jude 3. Now that system of faith has come. Thus, we're no longer under the Old Testament law of Moses. Now I say we because he reasons that way. Gentiles never were under it. But he had a lot of Jewish Christians. And you can see that in the writing of Galatians and even Romans and Hebrews. Thus he had to try to explain to them the design and purpose of the law for them. And of course it did show the coming of the Christ and the coming of his kingdom. And of course the laws of the kingdom. And we learn from Paul's writing 
to the churches of Galatia in Galatians 3, 23 through 27, that we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us as have been baptized to Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male nor female, for we're all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is the promise that God made to Abraham that through his seed singular would all nations of the earth be blessed. Now in contrasting what he was demanding of his subjects with the tradition people had heard, Jesus used this, for lack of a better way to refer to it, as a formula. Ye have heard. Or he would say, it hath been said. And then he would say, but, in contrast to what you've heard, or what hath been said, I say unto you. Now, examples of how he applies this included murder, adultery, divorce, perjury, retaliation, and benevolence. He told her all of those, and by approaching it that way, you've heard it have been said, but I say unto you. Matthew 5, 21 through 44. So in our study, we will consider what he said about divorce. But notice that it set in with all these other things that he said, and that's the context of it. The idea of the law had its place, and it's fulfilled it. Jesus fulfilled it. Now you're going to be under, as we know, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect law of liberty. So the teaching of Matthew chapter 5, verse 32 is repeated substantially in chapter 19, 9, which we've been spending a lot of time on. The difference is, is the difference in emphasis. In the latter passage, the focus is on the sin a husband commits if he puts away a chaste wife and marries another. In Matthew 5, 32, the focus is on the sin that he causes such a wife to commit by putting her away. And remember what we said this morning about the status of women and wives at that time. Remarriage on his part is not under consideration in Matthew 5.32. The wife likewise commits adultery if she puts away her husband, except for fornication on his part, Matthew 19.9, and marries another. As I say again, and I said last week, uh, in Mark's account of this, Mark chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, you'll find that he doesn't discuss the exception. So you have to take all these passages, understanding the subject under consideration, and then, in the context, putting them together, come up with the totality of the Lord's teaching on this subject. Notice that he points out, it hath been said. Well, of course, Jesus is referring to what we referred to this morning as Moses' writing in Deuteronomy 24, 1 and 2. And here's what he said. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it, and give it to her or into her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Now the Jewish rabbis, as to the grounds of this passage, allowed for divorce. Completely opposite views were held, as I've already pointed out, I think, last week, of the rabbis Hillel and uh, Shammai. One championed the liberal and popular view that uncleanness meant anything displeasing the husband. That's where we joke about burning the biscuits. So that was how widely liberal they were. While the other insisted that it referred only to an unchastity or adultery. I think it's obvious that the text falls short of stating specific grounds or setting definite limits when you read verses 1 and 2. The expression under dispute is uncleanness, literally a matter of nakedness implying shame or disgrace. Now we're trying to understand Matthew, I'm rather, Deuteronomy 24, 1 and 2 here. This, of course, uh, was too serious to include such whimsical and uh, frivolous grounds as were upheld by some of the rabbis. 
You know, this may sound strange, and I may have used it one time, but I remember in Austin, there was a fellow who was trying to see if he could be the preacher down in another town not far from there, and they asked him about his understanding of the scriptures regarding marriage, divorce, remarriage. His response was, what do you all believe about it? Because I can teach it however you want it. Well, that pretty well covers um, the view of some of the rabbis. People haven't changed. There's still people like that. Uh, just let me know how you want it, and I'll give it to you that way. But uncleanness likely encompassed less than adultery, for that was punishable by death. Deuteronomy 22 and 22. But no doubt it had to do with some unchastity. God has always been opposed to adultery. I think it's important to understand, even when you tolerated polygamy, that still, let's say man had three wives, still they were wives, and they were treated as wives, and God upheld them as wives. It wasn't just like you had a rooster and a bunch of hens in a chicken yard. It wasn't like that at all. When they married, such as when Jacob and the patriarchy married uh, uh, the two women, two sisters, they were still his wives, and they were treated as wives, and everybody understood them as wives. They weren't just a bunch of hippies in a commune back in the 60s living there. So God understood, all, well, I should say it this way, men understood that God treated, even when he tolerated polygamy, that each one of those women were wives, and they were treated as wives. So God's always been opposed to adultery, and that would have been the case where a man had one wife or five or six wives when he allowed for such so to be. The prophet Malachi warned, Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Now I read that this morning, but keep in mind now what we've read directly from Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 2. And a serious-minded, faithful Jew under the law of Moses would have understood how Malachi 2, 15 and 16 would have been referencing all that they had been taught, such as Deuteronomy 24, 1 and 2, and everything else bearing on marriage. And also said, you keep the right attitude that God expects you to have towards your wife. You cultivate that. And you make sure you don't think contrary to that regarding your wife. So you see, man's always responsible for his thoughts and his words and his actions. And he's expected to bring them into submission to whatever the revelation of God is. That's in our purview. That's in our power. It may be that I want to do this, that, or the other some way or not do something. But when I learn God's will, then I, I learn He wants it done. He wants it done in a certain way. And thus, I speak, Lord, thy servant heareth command, and I will obey. And that's the attitude every person, whether it be the time of patriarchy, the time of the Mosaic law for the Jews, or now under the authority of Christ the New Testament, that's the way it's always been. That's the attitude that God looks for in a person. That's what we mean by meek attitude or humble attitude. If God has ordained it be done this way, then our duty is to do it. I like the way it was uh, Brother Keeble used to always illustrate it as to how you act by faith, seeing that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. He said, if, if God said, Keeble, you jump to that wall. It's such me jump, God make the hole. In other words, I do my part trusting in God based on what He said in His Word that He'll take care of those things I can't do anything about. And that really is taking God in His Word, which is an act of faith. Now, according to Jesus in Matthew 19, 7 through 8, divorce had never been and still was not divinely intended. That's the reason I said this morning that if people would enter into marriage with the idea of the old man I knew in my first full-time local work, I've told you this before too, old brother Oliver looked at his wife Jenny and they were in their late 60s then. So I told her and I married her. She wasn't going to leave me because everywhere she went, I was going. Well, I think that's a pretty good example in a jovial way to say they're stuck according to cleaving to one another. Well, if you've got that attitude between a husband and a wife, it can all be worked out, folks. Whatever there is, it can be worked out. But when you're looking for a reason to dissolve things, then you're going to dissolve some way or another. And if you don't care about what God said about following His law, you'll justify yourself in it. You'll deceive yourself to thinking, yeah, but God understands my particular situation. And that's the way people do it. Well, he understands it all right. He understands you're not willing to do what he told you to do. 
So marriage is meant to be worked at. So when you enter into marriage, it's like Matthew 19, 6, a God-joined marriage, you have to first of all say, am I qualified by my God to contract a marriage? Now there's something else that ought to be considered, and we're not going to do all that right now. I don't know that we do anywhere near the teaching of saying, even if you've never been married, either person wanting to be married has ever been married, are you capable as a woman of performing the duty of a wife? Are you capable of a man of performing what God teaches now, what the Bible says, of performing your duties as a husband? Because you see, that brings other scriptural principles to bear. I think over my years of preaching in various places and my association with other people who knew the Bible on marriage, divorce, and remarriage and the obligations of husbands and wives, I think I've seen people who just on the surface were qualified to be married, but otherwise they weren't. They would have done better to stay out of a marriage because they did not have, for whatever reason, I say again, for whatever reason, they didn't have the wherewithal to perform what God says in the New Testament that a husband's obligations are in his role and the wife's obligations. I do not think we teach people along that line because we're so caught up in teaching on what I'm teaching on now. Because the Bible's full of material regarding the role of the husband and the role of the wife. So you may be fully qualified to unite in marriage, but are you qualified to do the work of a husband? Now that can be for various reasons. Uh, what I'm thinking of, people are not even responsible for being able to, to do certain things. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Well, you think about that further, and as I said last week, back to had Mark raise one question on one thing, let me suggest, Mark, and I was going to say this here, that you write that down, we'll take care of it when I get through the whole thing, and let's consider what you said. But I would say on this point, if you have other questions, you want to make notes, let's just, when I finish this whole thing, let's go back and take care of your questions. Because they're going to be based on what we're saying here now, whether you understood or didn't understand or something else came to mind that I didn't cover that would have a bearing on marriage, divorce, remarriage. So according to Jesus, back to our study in Matthew 19, 7 through 8, divorce had never been and still was not divinely intended. I don't think I emphasize that too much. And Moses had neither instituted nor commanded it, as some seem to think. It had only been tolerated because of the hardness of men's hearts. God knew that he had not got to the point in the history of man and in the cultural and social development of man to where it was time to give him the highest form of spiritual living, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So he tolerated things. One time God winked at this ignorance. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So in the development of man and the unfolding of the scheme of redemption down through all those many years, obviously God said, at a point out there in the future, I'm going to have this is what they must do. But right now, as it develops, I'm not going to hold them as strictly accountable. And if that's not what uh, one finds in Acts 17.30, I don't know what it means. It's obvious that during time in history, some things were bound and other things loose, but there was a point out here where that's no longer the case. That I will not tolerate those things any longer. And you got Jesus doing that, when immediately in Matthew 19, 9, he refers them back to the origin of marriage, back in Genesis, and doesn't deal with the law of Moses. And that seemed to surprise them. So because of the hardness of heart, men's uh, deviations from God's complete way was tolerated. And evidently it was to, and this might give some thought to other things, evidently that was to prevent some greater evil. In a culture where the rights of wives were often not recognized, this allowance was no doubt to favor her as much as possible. It was for her good. It served to protect her from the abuses of impulsive and unceremonious expulsion from her home and children and to provide her with legal proof of freedom to remarry should she be put away. Then he says, but I say unto you. So Jesus is going beyond Moses. And he's setting specific limits 
He's announced restrictions in substantial agreement with Shammai's interpretation of the law. Permission for divorce because of fornication was implied. Since the essence of marriage is one flesh, singularity between two, a man and a woman, and the union is for life, fornication is a fundamental breach of the marriage contract. It's a fundamental breach of the trust that each spouse is to have in another as they have committed themselves to God and to one another. If a woman should commit adultery after her husband has put her away for any cause other than fornication, he would be partially responsible for her sin by placing her in a position to be tempted. Now, if she married again, she would be guilty of adultery because God did not recognize her as divorced. Likewise, whoever married her would be guilty of adultery because, in reality, he would be taking another man's wife. Further, while both parties to the new marriage would be guilty of adultery, the husband who put away the woman would also share in her guilt, for he put her away. But not for the scriptural reason of her fornication at the time that he put her away. Now the question comes up now in the light of this study, uh, can a couple, and let me put this in quotes, live, quote, live, unquote, can a couple live in adultery? It should be pointed out that the partners in a forbidden marriage, notice a forbidden marriage, God forbade it, they don't have a right to marry, a Matthew 19, 6 marriage, should partners in that kind of marriage, a forbidden marriage, live in adultery? Sin is an act. Sin is an act. But if it is unforgiven and persisted in, it also becomes a state in which one is said to live. Now, that's pretty clear when you consider Paul's letter to the church at Rome and reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians in order to motivate them to faithful service, greater service. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live, there it is, live any longer therein? The idea is when you commit a sinful act and you do not do what God said to do to gain forgiveness, you're still guilty. You're in that sin. So, yes, uh, a couple can live in adultery. While the specific expression in the scriptures, live in adultery, does not occur, Colossians 1, or rather 3, Colossians 3, verses 5 through 7 mentions a number of items of disobedience in which those committing them are said to have once lived in them. One of which was fornication. Of which adultery is a species of fornication. If one can live in fornication, surely he or she can live in adultery. Furthermore, when you look at Matthew 5, 32... It says that whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Matthew 19, 9 says similarly, doth commit adultery. Now in both passages, the tense of the original word the Holy Spirit gave these writers has the idea of continuing to commit. The force of the grammar is that as long as the forbidden union exists between those who do not have a scriptural right to marry, the couple lives in adultery. That's the way the scripture reads. Now it seems to me that at this point, I think before we look further into this, that I'm just going to stop here in our study. Keep in mind what probably has been missed by a lot of people in the right division of the word that we can arrive at God's will not on this subject but another is that one and I want to emphasize this one can and oftentimes does live in sin how do you do it commit the sin and never 
do what God requires of you to get forgiveness of that sin, and you will be held accountable for that sin. So um, that ought to make us all, hopefully, as we're taught to examine yourselves, to see whether you be in the faith, understand what's being said. You can't just continue in sin. That God's favor to save you may abound. Because when you obeyed the gospel, you arose from the water the grave of baptism, all past sins remitted, and you're a new creature in Christ. Your goal is to be as obedient to Christ the rest of your life as you possibly can. You want to do that. So you're not going to be living in sin. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to go over here and do these things contrary to God's will because I'm in a state of grace. I'm now in the church where the blood of Christ flows and His favor is upon me. So I can have the blood continually wash these things away. You know, has got that attitude. doesn't have blood washing anything away. The idea is, as a new creature in Christ, a new creation in Christ, your goal is right the opposite from when you obeyed the gospel. Your goal is to live for the Lord as His Word directs you. So how could a person commit fornication and not be guilty of it, save they found forgiveness through obedience to the truth required, that was offered to give that forgiveness? And the same would be true of adultery. Think about that as it has to do not only with our subject here, but it has to do with any other transgression of God's law that a person gets into. Have the disposition of heart that you want to be saved from it. You want to change. Your goal is to be like Christ. You're not trying to defend something because of your pride. You're trying to get rid of it. Now that's the person that's going to have the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7, continuing to cleanse that person for sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we urge you, we beg you, we implore you by the mercies of Christ to be thankful that God has spared your life to once again have an opportunity to respond to the invitation of Jesus to become a Christian by believing that He is the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins and confessing your faith in Him and being baptized for the remission of sins. The child of God, what is your status? Is there a sin in which you're living? Or have you repented of it, confessed it, and prayed God for forgiveness? That's what ought to be. And that's the disposition of heart. It's a meek spirit and an humble spirit. It always wants to correct whatever it finds out that's wrong. And I'm assured that that's the person that's going to enjoy the blessed flow of the blood of Christ to keep him cleansed from sin. Because he's always ready to repent of sins and confess them. He wants to do it because he wants to be like Christ. If you need to do that, now's the time to do it. And we urge you to respond to the gospel if needed while we stand and sing this song of invitation.